Bishop Hepworth was born in Adelaide and was ordained about 30 years ago. He's worked as a priest in Britain and uh, also in rural Victoria at Ballarat under uh, uh, Bishop John Hazelwood. Um, John's married with three children. He um, is apparently a train buff. So if you're into steam trains, you might... We won't allow a question on steam trains during question time, but you might have an opportunity later on to share whatever such people talk about. Um, both Bishop Hepworth and his wife, um, Irva, um, academics, and they both lecture at the, currently at the University of South Australia. Um, Mrs. Hepworth in pharmacy, and uh, His Grace in politics. I have no idea what he tells his students about politics. So we thought we'd bring him along tonight and find out. <laughs> so those few words, I'd have great pleasure in welcoming John. Well, thank you um, very much. Is That's OK, is it? Um, we don't have these embellishments at... Um, Dawkins Universities. A bit up a bit, up a bit. A bit in threatening. You right? <clears throat> How's that? Right. Yes, we um, the, the normally operate in an environment where the students fill up from the back and never get to the front, so um, <clears throat> that should be all right. Um, <clears throat> when uh, Eric Butler wrote to me, he suggested that I repeat the talk I'd given to the Conservative Speakers uh, Club in. Um, Adelaide, which was entitled um, God, Mammon and the Economic Rationalists and um, <clears throat> was designed to be annoying, and indeed it was. <clears throat> I um, was taught by, um, among others, when I studied uh, politics, having studied theology, went back to university and studied uh, arts and politics. I really only fell abs absent-mindedly into politics. It was simply in the 1970s the one discipline in the arts faculty that never had exams and uh, on, on which simple basis an entire career has been built. But um, <clears throat> the, um, my first year lecturer was a um, Marxist. In fact, he was one of the people that when the Vatican decided to have a dialogue with Marxists, they searched the world for a couple of fairly tame ones and found him. And uh, he used to give a lecture every year designed to create heart attacks in the Faculty of Economics in which he would um, note that the entire capitalist world had been beset with great cycles and little cycles and uh, nobody had ever found a way of flattening economic growth and um, this caused enormous problems to most of the human race. He said, you know, economics, economists are always looking for things that co-relate and uh, they search for things that will make the uh, economic activity go up or unemployment go down and they're always trying different things because they haven't the foggiest idea what actually causes any of these things and um, <clears throat> they um, he said but th there is indeed as a result of his research he had discovered one thing which exactly rose and fall fell with western economic activity in the past century and he'd breathlessly plot this graph and a red chalk mark would be economic activity and we'd have a blue chalk mark for X which was the unknown variable. He said according to any modern economist having found the perfect correlation we have found the cause. And in the last moment of this lecture which you give every year whilst um, our colleagues the economists were frothing knowing what was going on across the way in the tea room in the last minute he would breathlessly announce that the blue graph was the incidence of dysentery in Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was well trained in politics and um, <clears throat> have had that uh, profound respect for uh, um, economics experts ever since <laughs> and have built a career on that too. <clears throat> 
But I um, will, of course, do what um, Eric Butler said, because it would be unthinkable in this company not to, and um, perhaps with some embellishments along the way, produce yet another tape, um, this time with some bells and whistles. But I, um, what I have to say is, in fact, um, whilst it has almost infinite potential for caricature, because the world is full of silly people doing both politics and economics, it's also, I think, profoundly serious and challenging. These are big subjects rather than little subjects. And I want to begin, since I've been challenged to, with the way I begin my first lecture with first-year politics students. And I tell them about Socrates, which is news to most of them, all of them. Uh, in fact, I teach in a university which I admit is one of the modern Dawkins glossy ones. Um, our letterheads have the same colours as the Adelaide Crows for reasons that we have yet to discover. But um, <clears throat> the, um, the, I begin this lecture, even though my university says we are not allowed to have a textbook published more than ten years ago, which creates certain problems when I list Plato's Republic, but the library rang me up triumphantly earlier this year and said they had found a Penguin edition published in 1992, so it would be all right. <laughs> <clears throat> and I was enormously relieved. Um, <clears throat> I tell them about Socrates and Socrates' great lecture in which he challenged the conventional wisdom of the day in which he told those first university students in the Olive Grove round the back of the Acropolis, which is still there, both the Olive Grove and the Acropolis, that um, it was all humbug. Now, doesn't this sound strangely modern? It's all humbug, he told them. Now, you've been told that there are gods and that the gods have some causal effect on life and that we can tell when the gods are angry and when the gods are happy. You've been told that you should live according to certain norms and purposes, and he said, and I'm telling you today it is humbug. In fact, we've just invented science under the next olive tree, and um, now that we've invented science, we will soon know the reason for everything, and it certainly won't be God. Then henceforth, humans who are clearly the top of the heap of all that we can see and perceive ought to be making their own rules for how they will live. And so from now on we will work out how human beings should live. Well the lecture was an enormous success as far as the students were concerned. It was less successful as far as Socrates was concerned because there's always one student in the front row who's more conscientious than the rest, ran down the road and told the clergy who immediately told the judges the guy ended up being sentenced to death of course for subversion which is regrettably a penalty not available to us at the moment and um, or we would empty Mr Dawkins universities quite quickly and um, <clears throat> and so Socrates of course was um, sentenced to death so there's a marvellous painting in the uh, art gallery of South Australia of um, Socrates drinking the fatal draught and collapsing into the arms of his weeping students I point out to them that this is not an experiment that I'd be game to try in case there was an absence of weeping and um, <clears throat> and the painting wouldn't look the same if they all had big grins on their faces but um, it was indeed now there is a marvelous story and dear old Plato of course after Socrates books were burnt records these events because he was one of the pupils who were weeping at the time and it made an obvious massive impression on him and he was much more careful and uh, Aristotle, of course, reversed the trend. He was Plato's pupil and he proved the existence of God. So it only took three generations of academics to get back to where they'd started, which is roughly the life cycle of academia. Um, <clears throat> and um, the crucial point is, as I explained to them, we are still living out the brawl that Socrates began. That was the first moment of the modern age of politics in which we still live and to which we can see no end in sight. It was the first great confrontation between a system which placed the point of reference about which I was speaking last night 
outside of humans themselves and looked at humans as creatures with a purpose which had been implanted from beyond their own consciousness. The confrontation between those and those who said humans are in fact the pinnacle of what has evolved and therefore set their own standards. Now that in fact has been the basic confrontation of Western thought for two and a half thousand years. Sometimes one side has appeared to win. One might have said in the 1960s that the poor mob claiming God had any influence on politics had been soundly defeated and would die out in a few years. About a third of the nations in the United Nations would now claim to be theocracies of one form or another, mainly thanks to Islam rather than Christianity, I might add, but nevertheless, we take support from wherever we can find it. And, um, <clears throat> and so the pendulum has well and truly swung the other way to the extreme discomfort of the humanists in advanced Western nations. All of that was with small letters and inverted commas. And so we have to live out this fight, and it brings us to the basic question of politics. And the basic question that politics demands we answer before, in fact, we can do any politics is the question, what are human beings for? Now, science can answer quite satisfactorily the question, how do human beings work? In fact, they're well on the way to it, and I suppose if this genome business gets going, we'll have more answers, far more than we can cope with in one lifetime. But we have never agreed as a human race on what human beings are for. And we have these two great models in conflict. Those who would take a deity-centered model of human existence in which the purpose of human life comes from a creating God who has given therefore relationships both between humans and God and between humans and all other creation. And those who say there is nothing implanted, we are the sum total of an accidental process and therefore must design our own lives as a community by casting aside the prejudices of the other model. Now, wars have been fought over that issue more than over any other issue in the last two and a half thousand years of history. And so we confront the most basic problem. Now, since we have not yet agreed on what we are for, it is not surprising that we have not yet agreed on designing political systems. At worst, People design them without any point of reference or philosophy and then wonder why they collapse. And more than um, half the nations in the United Nations at the moment have a constitution less than 20 years old. In other words, we have global politics at the moment that is measurably less stable than at any time in the last thousand years. Indeed, a large number of constitutions are less than 10 years old. We are constantly redesigning the system and the instability comes because it is <coughs> not based on any explicit philosophy of politics. Quite fascinatingly, we have a competition at the moment for the God-based models. If indeed one substitutes for God, government, governing people, the model nature, government, governing people very toughly so they don't muck up nature, then indeed we get an almost classic religious based model except it's invented by the Greens. Not surprising, people are a bit confused when they think they should be over here. But the last thing a group of Greenies are going to let is people make up their own mind about things like mining and design their own system. So in fact there is the seeds of massive conflict between the humanist model and the environmental model already I think showing fairly obviously and forcing us yet again back onto um, the basic 
foundations of what human beings are for. In the eyes of most greenies, human beings are an aberration in nature, which um, if only we were culled, nature would return to normal. Don't let human beings into nature or the environment because they will ruin it. We must have human free zones. It's a fascinating view of human nature if you only plunge it out a bit. I've asked greenies whether they're going to begin with themselves or us in annihilating people um, because obviously they're as bad as we are in their fundamental nature. <clears throat> in fact, if you read papers in Australia like the Financial Review, you will get a quite classic image of that model. The market was angry this morning and punished us by reducing the value of the dollar. Mm -hmm. The market obviously has a long white beard and floats on a cloud somewhere over New Guinea, looking down with intense annoyance or joy, punishing or rewarding, but quite a real force nonetheless. Try telling a modern economist that the market doesn't exist and you'll get a passionate medieval defence of the existence of God. <clears throat> in other words, the linear models, the God-centred models, are far more pervasive at the moment than we might imagine. And the humanists are in almost full flight. And they're not in full flight from the forces of what um, another lecturer of mine used to call the forces of organised superstition. He, he meant the churches. Um, but um, <clears throat> they are in full flight from... A, an accumulation of forces which are not yet a coalition because heaven help us speaking to each other but they are nonetheless a, a, an intellectual coalition that are talking about the same fundamental model humans are in some sense born with some form of original sin and need government to govern according to set norms to stop them tearing each other apart and destroying everything in sight that model is in fact extraordinarily popular it's just that many of the people that espouse it have not yet realised there are others in the same camp. So we are confronting some very basic questions in this. Now if we, um, we do that, we know of course that there are a certain number of answers and we'll come back to that in a moment. The question can then be asked whether the government we've got in any advanced Western country, let alone this one, in fact, govern according to any particular norms whatsoever. What is their basic philosophy? What have they spelt out? Now, the answer, of course, is nothing, because the polls have failed to give them a philosophy <clears throat> other than today's polls. And yet, they're not game to govern totally according to the polls. I had great in South Australia and the Northern Territory over euthanasia by constantly pointing out to media people that capital punishment in fact had a much higher polling rating and so don't tell me that we must have euthanasia because it's got 78% because capital punishment has 84 so what are you going to do about it mate? <clears throat> we are not entirely poll driven in other words no we don't adopt a humanist model without filters but we're not very open about the filters and where they're derived from. In other words, in the interests of integrity and honesty in government, we are asking of our politicians and bureaucrats the wrong questions. We are failing to ask them about their fundamental views of human nature. I don't recommend we do it because it's a very disappointing process, but we are failing to provoke them in that way. Now that leads me to make mention of this economic rationalism, which um, is some, one of those words that I feel we oughtn't to use in polite society. But we have used it, so there we are. Now, I want to go back a little bit. I'm constructing this story in parts, like a good lecturer with a few footnotes along the way. I can't regrettably go over to that side of the dais for the footnotes, which a good lecturer would, and then come back to the middle for the proper text, because the microphones don't follow. But anyway... We're I want to go back a little way and to remind ourselves, and in this gathering perhaps too much reminder would be um, uh, not the right thing to do, but to remind ourselves that once upon a time, before the Reformation, in the Middle Ages, 
and before. Right back to the Greeks. Money had a very clear basis for existence. Money, in fact, existed in quite direct relationship to both labour and agreed value, but was simply a means of exchange. And it was, of course, quite illegal to use money as any other commodity. It was illegal to use money as a form of investment. That was usury, and it was wrong. Now, one could digress, but one won't, onto the um, Christian ethics of using um, a group nicely established in a ghetto in each town to do the dirty work which was sinful for anybody else to do. Um, I could, if I were being totally scurrilous, tell stories about the last time I was in um, Israel, um, interestingly giving a lecture on ethics to uh, officers in the Israeli army, which is another experience again which I'll come to later, maybe, if you ask very nicely. Um, but um, the, uh, I was fascinated on the Sabbath day to find that um, the hotel had thoughtfully provided a, a non-Jewish person to press the buttons in the lift I was in, um, in the hotel I was in, so that one didn't have to do manual work. And I thought that is roughly parallel in morality to the uh, medieval Christian idea of having a mob of Jews down the road to handle the money lending, because it was clearly sinful for the Christians to do it. Um, one could skim over that, but I think it's not a bad thing to remind ourselves sometimes that our history is not quite as pure as we'd like to make out. The, um, but the idea of an exchange which was related to need and to value is crucial. And that whole relationship was smashed in the gap between the Reformation and the Industrial Revolution. It's pointed out quite cleverly by the likes of Tawney that of course the Reformation was the prerequisite because it changed individuals relationship with God. Before the Reformation one was saved through a community. People lived in community with extremely tight obligations within that community. The feudal system, common land, common harvesting of crops, tithing off to the church which was a splendid idea and all that. Um, but um, the idea that if one didn't work within community, one failed to exist. And that economic system was paralleled by a religious system. Try doing high mass on your own. It doesn't work. It can't be done. It's got to be done as a community. It takes a cast of hundreds to do it really well, especially if you're singing Palestrina. In other words, the essential acts of salvation could not be achieved by feeling good at home or in the fields or under an oak tree. It required community action of a highly sophisticated kind. Whether the community action was building the cathedrals and parish churches, which required casts of tens of thousands as far as we know, and hundreds of years. I read a marvellous book recently which suggested that most of the Gothic cathedrals of Europe were made during a brief period of global warming, which enabled the grape to be grown further north than had ever been the case before, and therefore the cathedrals by implication were done in an alcoholic haze. Uh, <clears throat> I rather liked this theory and I, I thought let's change our entire perspective on global warming. It may be a very good thing and um, <clears throat> lead to a new golden age. But um, it, it was a good try at writing a PhD and, uh, and we are running out of topics. <clears throat> It was written by an Australian who's been resident in Chartres and analysing the um, building of Chartres and, uh, and the handiwork of the builders carving the stone and where they travelled around Europe because similar stones are carved in different cathedrals and you could work out who worked on each cathedral during each building season. Uh, I presume by looking at the carving how drunk they were at the time. But um, <coughs> <coughs> that was a footnote. Um, you see... Academics these days must keep their students awake at all costs. <clears throat> and so the Reformation changed all that. 
and created a form of Christianity in which people could be saved by direct reference to God without the intermediary reference of priests and masses and so on. And then you have the terrible question of how do you know? I mean, if you've been to mass you can actually know. You know whether you were late and you know whether you left early and therefore you're quite clear on how much grace you got. On the other hand, if you are sitting feeling good about your relationship with God, there's just that nagging element of uncertainty. Except for some of my evangelical colleagues who seem more certain than I am, but still. <clears throat> and so prosperity came to be a touchstone. And yet prosperity demanded a completely different kind of money. The sort of money that could be invested and multiplied. Now when I did theology I was taught quite clearly that the nature of money changed. I'm not at all sure that the nature of Christianity didn't change rather more than the nature of money. But it was claimed that interest suddenly became legitimate because the nature of money changed. Well that's backhandedly true. Money became a commodity like other commodities which could be bought or sold thereby changing its value and creating a marketplace for it. It became something that one could invest. And therefore, of course, investment is simply the other side of the coin that says borrowed. And on that basis of free individual enterprise with a religious motivation, combined with a newfound free money market, the Industrial Revolution was built and to some extent the Empire was built. Now that created interesting problems that our civilization had not had to cope with before. For the last 300 years or so, we have had to deal with a world in which it was possible to be a good individual. Whereas the concept of the good individual was an impossibility until the Reformation. One's goodness was measured by one's goodness within a community. Even on the great monastic mountains of Greece, Mount Athos is a good example where the hermits live in the caves way up above. They are still linked to a community even though they never see it. The basket of food goes up on the pulley once a week. And only if it's not used does somebody go up and see what's wrong. Usually death is what's wrong. So it is possible for eccentric Christians to have separated themselves, but not completely. In fact, I've always thought that the hermits in the desert were more dependent on a community than most of the village people were. So there was no escaping the collegial basis of human existence and the obligation and counter-obligation. Even those who were expelled from the community, the lepers in the Middle Ages, still had their leper's window for receiving communion in the parish church, still had the place where food was left. In other words, even more dependent on the community than before they were expelled from it. So there was a glorious and complex relationship in which humans lived. Now I labour the point because in this century we have accepted very largely an orthodoxy in which the basic unit of society is the individual. I set an essay um, every year which in inverted commas um, says the basic unit of society is the family and then I go on to ask what basis does this statement have in contemporary political thought. This causes enormous problems to all the students and it's designed to but um, <clears throat> I get some bizarre answers but most of them profoundly disagree and feel that the basic building block of society is in fact the individual, unrelated and unencumbered. And I certainly don't prompt them in that conclusion. They find that all for themselves by watching around them what is done and how people behave. And when you think about it, even the invention of the motor car is an exercise in individuality. We no longer travel together, we travel in opposition to each other. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
thereby day by day encouraging a psychology of the individual in competition. And the fact that we as a community have achieved the road building is extremely abstruse because it requires a great deal of knowledge of public policy to find a connection between us and roads. The roads are something done by the other, the transcendent other. We don't even directly blame members of parliament for the conditions of roads anymore. Now it's extremely transcendent. The intimate day by day life has become one of competition with each other. How do we eat? By barging somebody else out of the way in the supermarket to get it to check out first. Now, almost every aspect of our common existence, the things like food and clothing and travel, the very fundamental things which society once existed to provide, are in fact now engineered to be competitive and to differentiate. Now that is a profound change and it's mirrored by the profound change in the nature of economics which encourages and even demands that we be differentiated. If under capitalism there is to be an accumulation then individuals will accumulate at the expense of others for the market demands scarcity to ensure value the punishment of the god with the long white beard over New Guinea whose name is Market. The punishment for producing too much money is to eliminate the value in the brilliant system we have engineered. So the market has learnt from bitter experience that its slaves will not too often produce too much of it. And so we have had to develop a philosophy and a religion in which the rich and the poor can exist more or less side by side and we have had to develop explanations of why that is good. Now what we did to overcome the very obvious problems, a system that is um, largely unacceptable to any basic understanding of Christianity, what we have done to overcome the problems was to develop the idea of government as a do-good agency. Government as charitable organisation, government as social worker. Early in the last century we saw the beginnings of this. The great debates about the abolition of slavery, just for starters. And governments had relatively little to do with economics. After all, the system demanded freedom. The idea that a government ought to control some sort of levers like destroying dysentery in Glasgow, thereby fixing Western economies by introducing flushing toilets. You know, this was, just wait for it, somebody will think of it. Um, <clears throat> and we rush out and do these great public works because they will fix things, won't they? And so, um, governments retreated from the economic. For most of the last century and a good deal of this century it has been political taboo to be too obviously seen to be involved in economics. What were governments for? Governments were to fix things from the unchristian economic system that was prevailing. Some would now call it safety nets and things but in fact it was dressed in more Christian terminology in the last century. And so governments did good works and looked after the poor and looked after education and built hospitals and generally busied themselves with all the things that the church did before the Reformation. Often in Europe in the same buildings that the church did them in before the Reformation. And there was nothing wrong seen with this. It was a way of allowing the unchristian to be Christianized through the medium of government activity. But that system continued fairly unchallenged until the 1970s. And then we had the first glimmerings of self-doubt. 
It is not the role of governments to be involved in. How often have we heard that phrase? And it prefaced a withdrawal from something that for 150 years that had been felt necessary for a government to do, largely regardless of cost. Now, there are always cost considerations. But in fact, a government set its social targets and then taxed as required because the target was more important than the level of tax. Suddenly, that was reversed. And under the banner of low taxation, as well as an ideological argument that it is not right for governments to do anything but have an economic role, governments began to withdraw. Now, if you compare elections in particularly the Australian states, 1960s and the 1970s, you get this absolutely sharp distinction. In South Australia, we had um, elections fought on factories and um, wage levels and uh, things um, in the 1960s. And then suddenly in the 1970s, we had elections fought on nude beaches and um, six o'clock closing and um, whether we were to be allowed to eat snow peas. You know, Don Dunstan famously went to Hong Kong and bought back a suitcase full of snow pea seeds because the federal government wouldn't allow them to be imported. And of course, no proper trendy pink hot pant wearing person could ever have a meal without snow peas. And so poor old Don was going hungry. And um, so he had these grown in a prison farm so that we could flood the market with snow peas. You can indeed blame us for that as well as the crows. But um, the, uh, in other words, every, we, we didn't think about economics in the 70s in election campaigns. And Whitlam fought two elections without mentioning money once, fortunately. He wouldn't have won either of them if he had, but um, he didn't. It was simply irrelevant. And then suddenly we changed. And we changed at the same time that everybody else did. In the 80s, it would have been bad form and not conducive to winning had a government had a social agenda. The social agenda of governments was dropped. Now, it was dropped in a fascinating way. It was dropped by beginning to put a real cost, and that's all in inverted commas, on the delivery of the social agenda of governments. At the heart of economic rationalism is the idea that one can put a price on everything that humans, as well as governments, do. We had that debate among feminists of the price of housework, an intermittent debate about paying women to stay at home and what would happen to the economy if indeed they were paid a real wage. <coughs> and it was quite a fascinating debate too. We have debates about the real cost of caring for the aged at home or the real cost of childcare at home. We've even got a system in Australia at the moment which pays people for looking after children from down the street. And so we began to try and put a wage on everything. Having done that, we worked out that governments couldn't afford to do everything because that much money didn't exist. And so we had to drop certain things because we couldn't afford them anymore because we generated a price for them which had never been there before. We then desperately wanted, and this is the second part of economic rationalism, having generated a price for everything, we then said government agencies and departments <coughs> must be accountable for the spending of government money. Now what had happened before then was government departments put in a budget at budget time for what they were needed to do and added a bit and hoped for the best and did it and either made money or lost money. They never gave any money back because they always found something else to do in late June if they hadn't spent it all. Now to that extent wasteful and seditious and so on. In another way it was setting the priorities of the government and then giving the department the wherewithal to do it. In the 80s, we got a mania under economic rationalism for corporatizing, that is, turning government agencies and departments into something that looked like a private company. They had an input, which was the need to provide services. 
and they then needed to cover the cost of what it cost them to give the services and so they generated a price which if you live within that manic world was a real price and that had to be recovered either by the government giving them the money for the real price it's called um, case what's it called in hospitals in Victoria you know what I mean yes yes it's a fascinating version of it case mix um, you generate a real price for every service that's going to be given providing one bedpan two dollars ninety five right 5.3 million bedpans a year means we have to cover 10.89 million for bedpanning in this hospital this year. Because we've worked out that it takes 2.91 minutes per bedpan fixing. I mean that that is literally what goes on. In waterworks the cost based on finding a real value of the River Murray water in any given year and then costing paying for it. You know, it's um, as if and then demanding that these departments turn a profit because after all the government is the shareholder. Now what has happened there and I think that last example says it all what has happened is a fundamental change in the nature of government which mirrors the fundamental change that's already taken place in the nature of money separated by several hundred years. Once a government was the agency of the community performing those things which the community had decided needed to be done. That was a very imperfect democratic world but that was basically the way. Try shutting down schools or hospitals the government discovered that the community reacted. The governments of economic rationalist nations and that's all the West and it would be most of the East if we could get them to understand. But all the West, and how we go off at Moscow for not doing it at the moment, I mean to say. But it's all the West. We have removed the government from the morality of the provision of services and made the government merely a manager for a range of activities for which it accepts no responsibility. In other words, we have withdrawn the government from the area of public life and made the government simply a manager of what is private. Now I would not be so suspicious about that if there hadn't been at the same time a brawl going on about what is public and what is private. Those of you who grit their teeth and um, read what my colleague um, Bishop Crawley um, keeps describing as the writings of the feminazis. Um, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what he means by that. And anyway, um, he keeps putting it in faxes to me. The latest doings of the feminazis in Vancouver, he says. Um, but what I think he means is some of the contemporary debate about whether there is anything that is private or whether everything is private. Now the marvellous clash of wills here, you can see it in the debate in Australia in the late 80s and early 90s between feminists and the homosexual lobby. On the one hand the homosexual lobby was saying there are certain activities beyond the reach of government. There is an area of the private and the government has no right to make laws for what is private. The government has no role in the bedrooms of the people, you've heard. <clears throat> which may well be true, but th that was the slogan being used for nefarious purposes. On the other hand, we had a lobby mainly concerned with domestic violence saying that there is no area of life which is private. or Everything is public and the government must control it. And, uh, and a quite massive battle in some journals that uh, surface around universities between the two groups, who were clearly only one group would win. Now, in fact, the debate stopped before either group had completely won, so what we have yet again in Australia is marvellously displaced legislation, which, if we put it all on the table side by side, makes no sense at all. We have governments claiming, on the one hand, an intimate role in the bedrooms of the people when it comes to bopping somebody, and absolutely no ro role... Anyway, I, I would use various words if I was speaking <laughs> to my students, but um, the, uh, you could see that one coming, maybe. But... Um, <coughs> 
and that would have kept them awake well in past the 30 minutes. But um, we, in other words, failed to have the fundamental debate about the role of government. And while part of society was tearing at governments to restore the distinction between private and public, which of course is anathema to many people because traditionally in, in the high middle ages of um, Aquinas and Christianity, women were put in the private bit and men in the public bit and it was a distinction that needed something done to it possibly, um, at least in a number of contemporary ideologies. So uh, on the other hand, um, we had governments themselves being told by economists that they were totally private and that there were really no activities properly defined as public. And then they would make little exceptions for the criminal law and edge themselves a tiny marketplace. But what we almost achieved along the way was beyond the criminal law, governments without the means to do anything. In fact, owning nothing and controlling nothing, but simply passing laws and hoping for the best minimal public service, almost nothing owned by government, not even the basic delivery of services, neither hospitals nor electricity nor water, and even Athens demanded the government's own water. Adelaide famously has sold its water supply to a French company, which immediately turned on the wrong tap, possibly because the labels were not in French, at the sewerage farm and almost destroyed the whole of Adelaide in a massive flood of sewerage. We, um, for three months had, um, had nothing but sewerage stench over the whole of Adelaide because the French company had mucked up the sewerage treatment works. Um, and uh, when I described it on the radio as French sewerage, they took massive umbrage and threatened to sue me. But um, I felt it was a fairly accurate description. They undoubtedly owned it. And uh, the fact that um, France had paid $1.3 billion for Adelaide sewerage, I found faintly amusing. But um, and it's still unclear what they plan to do with it, but um, what they eventually did do with it was a marvellous uh, case because to destroy the smell, this is clearly a footnote, but to destroy the smell, they um, bought 40 tonnes of peroxide, which was the entire stocks in Australia at the time, and dumped it on it. So whether or not it destroyed the smell, at least we now have the world's only bleached sewage. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> Now these examples of um, you know, the government could do nothing. It neither owns it nor controls it and it was vaguely fuming, taken literally, about the, um, about the contract. But in the end the government was left with the same means as any private individual. It could have sued the French if it could have found a convenient court and that was all. And in the end it decided it wouldn't bother. And so not even the contract was enforced. The government, in other words, had reduced itself to the same powerlessness as any other individual with a problem with a big company. And it took the same pathway as most of us do when we have problems with big companies, make a lot of ribald fun and know that we can't do anything about it. This is a fascinating change to the nature of government. Now, we could ask a number of questions. Let's ask what does it do to democracy? Have we indeed created a system which is more democratic? Now I'd suggest that we haven't. We have indeed created a system which has almost no residue of democracy. Because in fact we elect a government which has stripped itself of power. It stripped itself of social power as well as economic power. We have elected a government which is amoral because it no longer can find within its ambit of powers a theoretical power or a theoretical justification which would allow it to make moral judgments for society. It's not an, a coincidence, I believe, that governments in Australia as elsewhere in the last 15 years have become less and less moral. The only debate about pokies and gambling in general now is a debate about the contribution to the budget bottom line. It's impossible to get a debate going about the morality. As we saw before dinner, a debate about the nature of the family as legislated for by the marriage laws. 
it's almost impossible to get a debate going about that in Australia, even though other nations are beginning to have such debates. Debate about human life don't start, as we saw with the euthanasia debate. Almost impossible to have a debate on principle. In the end, the most telling argument was the fact that it's not a very safe law because lots of us might get knocked off by accident. The idea that there could be some constant thread through society of respect for life and we could argue from that basic premise was terrifying. Because in fact if you argue that on euthanasia you very quickly get into both capital punishment and abortion. You can't have a separate argument about human life for each area and contradict yourself. And since we are absolutely determined as a society that we will not spell out anything to do with capital punishment or, or abortion, we crippled ourselves for a debate about euthanasia. which we haven't yet had, even though we've spent some months in the Parliament not having it. <laughs> this leads me to a further point in which we cripple ourselves. Now, I won't mention the rude word multiculturalism because I honestly don't know what it means. I've asked, um, I, there was a suggestion in my faculty that we name a school something or other and cultural studies and I innocently asked what cultural studies was and got some appalling looks and then somebody said it's obvious it was not obvious to me I have no idea what cultural studies are I'd love to know it was the language people putting this idea up says it is to do with foreign languages <clears throat> no not exactly I said well is there any explanation can you tell me a book not really. And then it was explained to me that it was postmodern. And um, I explained that not even bishops were fortune tellers. And since I was modern, that was the present, postmodern must be tomorrow, and I'm not quite sure what that adds to the debate. Mm. That didn't get me far either, I might add. And um, then somebody did give me something, and I couldn't understand a word of it because they were obviously doing the Alice in the Looking Glass Act and making up the meaning of the words as they went along because it didn't make sense. Um, every now and then this happens to me as chair of my ethics, university's ethics committee, we get a post-modern application which I send back to be translated into English, <laughs> thereby yet further incurring the wrath of various areas in the Faculty of Arts. But um, we have denied ourselves the opportunity in all of this for debating the boundaries of pluralism. Now, if indeed we are to have small government stripped of powers, the corollary of that is that we allow society to have many elements blooming. And indeed we're doing it with a vengeance. But we have failed to have, as I've said, any of the preliminary debates which would set points of reference. We've had none of the preliminary debates which would set standards. Therefore we've had none of the preliminary debates which would allow us to set the acceptable norms if we are indeed going to exist as a pluralist society. And I've seen several examples of this absurdity. It's one of the tenets, and I think we'd mostly say fair enough, of modern feminism that young women should be respected and not sold into underage marriage and various other things that seem to have been done in society until quite recently in some places still are. So far so good. And so Australia's marriage law set minimum ages for marriage but there are certain dispensing powers that magistrates were, allowed, were given which were believed in the 70s even by Lionel Murphy would hardly ever be used. And New South Wales for several years has had a magistrate sitting full time dispensing from the age of marriage for females who are being married into Islamic marriages. An Islamic magistrate appointed for that sole purpose. Now quite clearly that is an absolute defiance and contradiction of almost every equal opportunity law that Australia has ever enacted. <clears throat> 
there is a clash of values. Either we're in favour of underage marriage for everybody or we're not. But to allow it for one group because it's a cultural necessity is a humbug, if I may say so, without fear of... I thought I'll insult a wide range of ethnic communities, I'll get away with this. And, um, <clears throat> the, um, but it is clearly a humbug. We have simply not sorted out where our values are and have no mechanism for sorting out contradictions in clashes. I mentioned the other one of gay laws versus, um, f versus um, uh, domestic abuse laws. Now there are many examples when you go looking for them that we are a society without a mechanism for defining the boundaries. Once we would have said people must accept the political system in which we exist and let a thousand flowers bloom in what you do privately in religion and so on. Once that was the Australian explanation. The political system was sacred. But the economic rationalists have almost entirely removed the political system and have certainly removed its ability to set normal social parameters. Therefore the precise mechanism we used to use to create national unity has been diminished because we privatized it. We in other words have gone a very long way down the track of destroying the basic political structure by which we are governed having already very largely destroyed the economic structure. Now if we add to that, and I'm reaching a conclusion, but if we add to that the lack of sovereignty, then we have an extremely potent mix for disaster. Now it's been mentioned earlier, in the last 20 years, our rush to internationalize. Now I hasten to add, as somebody who teaches diplomacy, to people I hope won't all become diplomats, um, a nation's freedom not only depends on independence, sovereignty, it also depends on being dependent. A network of dependencies. If many nations depend on us, for instance, to be fed or clothed, it is in their best interest to ensure we continue as a stable, free and enthusiastic mob. The art of diplomacy is not to create autonomy but to create networks and to control them. And I've never been terribly worried that Australia seems to have so many foreign air force bases from half of Southeast Asia seems to use us for taking off and landing and things and the United States still does to some extent and so on. I'm worried about where we put these places, the act of lunacy that put the Singapore Air Force Base at the end of the runway at Perth Airport must go down in all time history as an act of um, considerable stupidity. Um, but um, I was never awfully worried when B-52s used to fly from Guam and pretend to bomb Darwin. I thought it added a touch of excitement to an otherwise dull life and there was always the chance that they'd miss. But. Um, <laughs> And indeed they gave us one of the aeroplanes to stand on the runway at Darwin, which was rather nice of them when they'd finished bombing us. And um, that was never a great worry to me, because it established networks which we were in control of, to a great extent. The fact that the Sultan of Brunei has a cattle station in the Northern Territory to produce his own cattle for beef is probably quite nice. After all, when the pilot strike was on, he did lend us all his aeroplanes so we could get round the country. The networking and dependencies can be worked extremely well and have never been considered in diplomacy to have infringed on sovereignty. But we are now finding another form of the loss of sovereignty. Once upon a time, sovereignty was measured by the ability to control one's borders. The two great tests for recognizing another nation, government in effective control of its people, that's a joke, and um, a government with the ability to defend its borders. That's a joke. Once we reach the stage of satellite communication, we realize that there is no Australian, for instance, has access to the plug for phone and fax messages in and out of Australia. And the Indonesians have one plug, because we rent one of their satellites, because ours went about this far off the ground in China and fell down again. So we're sadly lacking in some satellites. Um, so we lease the Indonesian one. I mean, there's only one government 
with the ability to control the news every night that goes out from Darwin to Asia, the Australian television service, because we use an Indonesian relay satellite to get it out. So Indonesia can censor the news, but we can't. And they haven't, I might add, but they could. <coughs> we have no control over internet. There's that marvellous example of the uh, monastery in Mexico which has a solar-powered um, a satellite phone, a solar-powered computer, and it puts out internet sites totally free of any infrastructure. It's not connected to the local electricity or anything, phone line, nothing. And so its government has no control over what it does and what it receives. That is a bigger diminution of sovereignty than we have realised. In fact, with modern weapon systems, no nation can control its borders, even against aggression. And so in the last 20 years, governments have not only shed internal power in the way that I've been describing, they have shed external power. No nation is any longer as sovereign as it was. Because no nation can any longer fulfil the basic requirements that once diplomacy demanded for recognising a sovereign nation. Now if we add to that the conscious loss of economic sovereignty, I also set an essay every year which is quite a simple question, who controls the value of the Australian dollar? The, um, as far as I can work out the correct answer is two money lenders in Lyon. Um, who in fact are the biggest dealers in Australian dollars in Europe and, uh, and North America. But we do know that um, roughly 70% of all Australian dollars in existence exist outside of Australia and will never come here again. In other words, the Australian dollar that we use as an instrument of value and exchange is irrelevant alongside the Australian dollar that is an international commodity. And we merrily print dollars, even though they're now made of plastic and we don't need to replace them, because there is such a demand for Australian dollars offshore, not to spend on anything, but to trade. And yet the value of that trading, by two money lenders in Lyon, who did take on the French government in relation to the mark versus the uh, franc several years ago, and won, they ended up to be holding more French currency than the French government was, the French government in that competition, you may remember, lasted 12 days. After that they ran out of money and couldn't prop up the franc anymore. And the guys down in Lyon still had tons left. And so the money lenders beat the government yet again. Australia's never really tried to take them on, and I don't think we ever would, because we're basically fairly happy with the fact that they're largely removing the devalue of the dollar, because Tim Fisher seems pleased with it, that is everything that matters. <laughs> <clears throat> the effect of that on sovereignty, added to everything I've been saying, gives us an image of the modern Australian government which has shed most of its power and potency in the last 20 years. We are, in other words, confronting a different world. Given all of that, and I finish with this point, given all of that, and given the fact that I started with, that humans have yet to agree, and in fact are still in a state of extreme antagonism over the most basic of all political questions, we are creating in the global community a vacuum which is there to be filled and which must be filled to avoid advanced international anarchy. In other words, this is a moment of opportunity, and I end on that moment of hope. Those with coherent answers have probably never had a better opportunity to provide them. The system has emptied itself of meaning. We know that there is a global economy, but we really can't identify who runs it. The white beard over New Guinea is as satisfying an explanation as any because we don't have a better one. We are in the classic position of the primitive ancients who invented the best gods they could 
to provide an explanation for the things that were beyond their wits to explain. That is where modern economics and politics has reached. And just as they were ripe for more intelligent explanations, so I believe is the modern world ripe for more intelligent explanations. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some time for questions. <clears throat> we appreciate that uh, you're still really in uh, assimilation mode. Um, yes. Gods yes. In Wall Street. Question. Uh, Just towards the end of, end of your address, you talked about the diminution in the, of our sovereignty. Now, you know the nature of wars the vacuum, so this sovereignty must have disappeared and it's from somewhere. Who's got it? <clears throat> For the purpose of the take, the question is um, if the Australian government's sovereignty is diminished, since nature abhors a, a vacuum, to where does that sovereignty appear to have gone? The interesting thing in that is, is that it hasn't necessarily gone to other governments, because most governments are doing the same things. What we've had in the past where nations have diminished is that other nations have risen in importance to accommodate them. Now, we don't have that. Even the government of China, which is not a good government, um, in fact, it's an appallingly nasty government, but even the government of China at the um, uh, plenary session of the Communist Party last month voted to downgrade its powers in line with economic rationalism. Now, when the Communists start doing it, it's a serious problem. And... Uh, they are going to let the free market bloom in many ways. And it's been noted that they won't be able to hold political power if they give up economic power. Indeed, they're already finding it very difficult. So um, it's not flowing as a water pipe to somewhere else. That's, I think, not the image. What we've really got is the, the image of the Roman aqueducts just before the fall of Rome. The system is clogged with rubbish and there isn't as much flowing as there was. In other words, there is, if you like, less sovereignty in the world than there was 20 years ago. It's a commodity that is diminished rather than flowed. Now having said that, there are some places trying to get the edge. Um, we are seeing an unprecedented growth in private sector networks. Now they don't always show us private sector companies, the great transnationals. Um, because the networking is sometimes difficult to determine. But they're certainly showing as networks of transnationals. And it's generally agreed that the bottom 100 nations in the UN now have um, smaller economies than the top 100, 100 companies, the top 100 transnational. You can play with all these statistics, but it gives you some image. We now have in our region a large number of sovereign nations that have smaller economies than many companies. So why don't we admit the companies to the UN and chuck out the nations? You know, and, and that's something that I, I'm not the first one to suggest it. Now there is undoubtedly a growth of sovereignty there and the use of pseudo-nations for transnationals to establish themselves is entrenched. Now by a pseudo-nation I mean a nation that has absolutely no hope of controlling anything. Now, there are dozens of them in Africa, Central America, Increasingly, Australian companies are using home bases in Central America to avoid government control. In other words, we now have a number of places that are called countries, but I don't believe they act as nations, in that they lack the capacity to control the countries that are operating within them. You may like to speculate whether that is also now true of Australia. It's partly true, at least, of Australia. And... Um, in other words, the sovereignty has in one sense at least shifted to the private sector. Now that's not surprising when governments have been shifting their power to the private sector. The mob who run Adelaide's water and would run the surge if they could work out which tap, um, 
also run most of the water supply for Great Britain, most of the water supply for France, Germany and Italy, and a good deal of the water supply in Central America, and they're here to develop water supplies in Indonesia, Singapore and Malaysia as they develop. That's why they wanted a home base in Australia. We gave away a great chunk of government sovereignty to them. But they now run the water which once was expected of a government. Mm -hmm. Your tap goes off, you now ring France. You don't ring the government. The government has nothing to do with it. Don't talk to us, we sold it. Mm -hmm. So you can see an ebbing and a flowing, but I think the, the, the two models together, that there is an overarching diminishing of, of the amount of sovereignty to go round. In other words, the world has become more like an anarchy. And at the same time, there has been a flow from the government sector to the private sector of what we would have defined as real sovereignty. Taken together um, creates an image of a world that has, is less controlled and therefore more like an anarchy. And yet it's not the governments that are less controlled, it's the private sector that is less controlled. Um, I might interpose with a question of my own, then I'll take one from you. Uh, <coughs> Sess, uh, no, just a moment, with, well, the, the second one's behind you. I, I was interested in your point, um, Your Grace, about multiculturalism, even though you don't understand what it is, um, uh, with respect to what's traditionally been a, I suppose, a Christian uh, attitude to marriage and therefore the rights of minors not to be uh, entered into marriage before they are of sufficient age to be responsible for themselves. Um, if we are going to be a multicultural society, there are a whole range of cultural um, clashes of, of that similar nature. W one obvious one is that if we're, if we're going to yield to the Muslim and any other culture, uh, in their own sense, legitimate cultures established and uh, represent many millions of people, on that, um, in the Muslim faith, they are permitted to have three wives. Um, now, pardon? They're allowed to have three wives. They're yes, not, permitted. Yes. They're, not, they're not compulsory no. uh, for everybody. <laughs> um, and obviously, if we're going to yield on one point of marriage, perhaps we have to look at putting aside bigamy as a crime, because it's not going to be universally applied crime for a start. And <clears throat> theoretically, you can go to some quite outrageous lengths. One, um, for instance, is some of the voodoo cults, which are quite alive and they're and well represented, even states like in nations like the United States. Female circumcision is regarded as having some value of a cultural nature. Um, what do we do when we come to those things that we're very tabooish about, and from a Christian perspective, bloody well ought to be, and I am, but nevertheless, if we're going to allow multiculturalism, we're going to have to allow it. And what is the reason, what is the attitude of the sort of liberal, open-minded person to multicultural, the practicalities of it. If they want to walk, they want us to walk one mile, what happens if we walk two? And I suppose if you want to become absolutely bizarre, it is entirely possible, with people wanting to return to their roots, that people of central Indian extraction may want to look again at the traditions of the Aztecs, and uh, <clears throat> some may even volunteer for human sacrifice out of a genuine religious commitment. Will we, what do we do? So where do you think that's headed, the question is, and, and how is society going to handle that? Well, how society will handle it is probably very badly going on past performance. Um, th there is a real clash in Australia between the various multicultural councils and the human rights commissions, which is worth watching from a safe distance. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
because the, these sorts of clashes are being addressed very directly there. And the basic fact is we have very little to go on in designing a multicultural society. Now, the normal pattern has been human invasion and then the other mob towed the line and did what they were told or quickly got shot or whatever the current rate was for doing them in. And um, so in fact we don't have a lot of models, we have absorption models that are really quite fascinating but in the end the absorption flows predominantly one way with a great influence from the other group. Now, in fact multiculturalism sets aside that absorption model and very consciously in Australia integration is ended we're going to have multiculturalism. So it's been defined as not an absorption pathway but in which we are deemed to be big enough to have a number of cultures. Now honestly what I believe we thought 20 years ago was Butte, we can all eat pizza with a clear conscience. It was, regard it was in the area of food and very little else. And suddenly it's flowed over into marriage customs, family customs and so on and we're increasingly seeing the norms that we had set as a society pre-multiculturalism to the norms of human interaction, human violence, sexuality and so on which had all been fairly clearly worked out suddenly under some form of stress. Now they're under some form of stress at the same time that they were all being re-examined as a society anyway under the influence of a range of philosophies um, from feminism through to uh, gender inclusive philosophies and um, some of which we were obviously prepared en masse as a society to accept. Now, I've heard very little argument even in conservative quarters about allowing women to sign cheques um, <clears throat> which was clearly illegal in the middle of this century in Australia. Um, in other words a good deal, uh, yeah, I, I don't mean to be rude about the feminist agenda because a good deal of it um, we, we have taken on and, and unblinkingly at that uh, and modified our own family behaviour accordingly. Others of it we bulk at in various proportions and at various places. So um, the debate in other words is yet to be had and as I was saying earlier we haven't set a system that would enable us to have the debate, that's the worry. Alright, next, the next question, <coughs> Mr Turner. Uh, <coughs> just a basic question. Uh, are the finances of Australia and the world under private uh, control? And if, they, if it is, how is it physically possible people to practice the first principles of democracy when the finances of the country are under private control? The question is, if the finances of Australia and other countries are um, not under the control of their governments, how, does, how can democracy function when that sanction isn't available? Um, the basic answer to that, I think, <coughs> is that you can't. Um, the essence of democracy is the possibility for people to be equal under the law. As the scope of law diminishes and the role of um, private and uncontrollable forces grows, the possibility of treating people as equal under the law disappears. And in fact um, one of the great flaws of capitalism has always been that possibility. And even Karl Marx, in one of his saner moments, foresaw that the logical conclusion was one person owning all the money and that was the end of that for the world and everybody else in servitude. Now, it was one of his better moments. It is the logical conclusion of the capitalist system uh, as, as one accumulates and accumulates and reinvests and reaccumulates. So, um, it's a very real possibility. And I would have thought that the world is far less democratic now than it was even 20 years ago, even though half of it was communist 20 years ago. Because it's the advanced democracies that in fact are shedding democracy at the present time. And we're keeping up the semblance of it, we vote like mad. The institutions are all still there, it's their relationship to reality that is the worry. And humans are very good at keeping institutions going for several centuries after they've ceased to serve any practical purpose. So the shell of democracy thrives but in fact we know that the forces are somewhere else. It's rather like having a general election in Indonesia. We all know the army runs the joint. Mm. 
but we have elections and it's hurrah for elections because a bit of democracy is better than nothing. But in fact, um, almost half the seats are reserved for the army anyway. So even while you're voting, you're electing the mob that's running the country in real life. And most people realise that there is something basically inane about that form of democracy. As in Singapore, where you, you, the electorate seem to consist of apartment blocks. And uh, you know quite well that if that apartment block votes for the opposition, they'll turn the water off for the next three years. So nobody does, quite wisely. My next question, I think, was here. Yeah. You comment on the, uh, the, the little man with the beard over New Guinea and where he's going. Uh, what I was saying was that uh, hasn't that said that uh, gone to Wall Street and international finances? The, the question is, is the um, white bearded god, the market, um, the Senate over New Guinea actually gone to Wall Street? Well, I wouldn't include Wall Street once, but not now. Um, the US clearly doesn't set the value of the US dollar anymore either. It has an input. Well, we have an input too. I mean, we, we can say hurrah for us for about 24 hours, um, at which stage Sydney runs out of ready spondulee from the Reserve Bank, especially now they've given away the gold. But um, we, in fact, have no real means of controlling our dollar. They have no real means either. The, we've seen that the main force in controlling the value of the US dollar in the past decade has been the yen. And you've then got to ask who sets the value of the yen and who, can, who decides the yen will make whoopee on the dollar on any given day. And um, that's another talk. But it's clearly not Wall Street. Uh, they are a vital player, but not the player any longer. Um, one of the reasons for creating the, this extraordinary European currency um, is to balance out the yen and the dollar and clearly the European currencies are influential as well. Um, but many other things are influential as well and uh, the problem is that most Western currencies are now more speculated than used. And so we have a system in which the Western economies are essentially instruments of speculation. Now, it's the first time in history we've tried that one on, and we don't know what will happen as a result because we've never tried it before. But um, the private, but with public links, like Wall Street is, is a private organisation, if you like, in the broad sense, but with very specific public links back into the US government. Uh, that sort of institution appears to exercise now less control than it would have even in the recent past. Now, I'm being quite consciously vague because I think the correct answer to who controls Western economies is we don't know. Nobody has yet been able to tell at the present time. We could have told 20 years ago. I don't believe we can now. We've got a lot of ideas, but certainly the number of... Um, of organisations that have vital roles and about which we know almost nothing are growing. Now I can leave you with one example. You may recall that the US, Britain and France and Italy spent a vast sum of money a couple of years ago trying to destroy the money laundering network globally of one drug cartel in Colombia. Now it cost them about 40 million dollars for the project and they managed to close down that money laundering for about two and a half months. Now that's one drug cartel and the amount of money that they were shifting around was influencing the value of the US dollar. In other words, the groups we're dealing with here are not the groups we once did and the global circulation of drugs and their production is certainly a vital part and a measurable part of the value of Western economic activity. And that's one that we don't often mention in the same breath as Wall Street, if indeed they're separate things. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman, just taking a, a liberty, um, the figure, because I've talked to Reserve Bank um, economists about it, the 
<coughs> the expenditure per day of Australian dollars amounts to $7,000 for every living Australian. $7,000 per day is the expenditure out of financial institutions of Australian dollars. And it's $120 billion a day. Our trade. And, well, that's debits, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, out of Australian financial institutions. Mm. Um, I believe, and I've discussed it with them, that um, a hundred and five of those billions are, are debits that have to do with exchanges between Australia and foreign uh, nationals or entities. The interesting thing about the question is whether um, and there's two questions in a sense when you are when you're asking about um, can we when we don't have control have some form of democracy um, as, you, as the bishop has answered it no but nobody it seems to me is asking the question is are there mechanisms if we can find the will for government to, to reclaim sovereignty? That's a different question. And, and I just want to put my two bobs worth in and say yes, I believe they are. They have been identified by very small numbers of people and are in, in the process of preparation, but nobody is interested at the moment in them at all, as far as I can tell, at any, at any level in society or government. Mm. Next question. Uh, Stephen. You talked about loss of sovereignty, and uh, as I just watched things taking place, and heard earlier Mr. Button make reference to the idea of applying uh, to the fault as the hope of the situation. And if you look around, like you've got uh, little pockets of disaster, like you can see the gambling thing uh, as a big empire in Victoria. Do some of your clergy colleagues ever ponder upon these little disasters or large disasters and looking at what a uh, prescription might offer or that they hadn't considered before in terms of uh, God's abundant policy will become what we can do to produce a very effective alternative to what's taking place because I saw what some of these, some of your fellow clergy on CV opposing the gambling situation for example, that's all they can do are uh, the uh, opposition parties all they can do is oppose it, but they don't have a really constructive alternative, uh, tremendous alternative to spring forth in light of that disaster? Yes, the uh, question, it, it relates to um, clergy being able to creatively um, offer solutions to these problems. And uh, I, I, can I start with a brief commercial? I haven't had a chance yet. Um, <clears throat> the um, <coughs> I know that the mainstream churches have grappling with this. Uh, the Anglican Church, of course, is going through a split up of some proportions, which um, I'm somewhat part, somewhat unwillingly, but um, the, the liberal side of the Anglican Church, and that's, not, that's not a term of endearment, um, is shedding itself of conservative elements around the world, and it's something of a tragedy of quite vast proportions and people are regrouping so people like myself have um, find ourselves virtually thrown out um, when I returned to Adelaide from Darwin for instance I uh, as a priest I've been a parish priest in Darwin while lecturing at the university as well the Archbishop of Adelaide refused to license me unless I signed a, on oath that I would not speak publicly on the subject of the ordination of women um, so I didn't, and so the traditional Anglicans, if you like, picked me up. Um, I was a piece of flotsam on the beach. And uh, there's a lot of people like that around in Christianity and a lot of regrouping. Um, and the commercial is that a number of people here have asked me if we have any publications about all this. I have a list here with a biro. If you put your name and address, I'll happily send you out a couple of issues of our publication so you know uh, who the traditional Anglicans are and uh, where we fit into global Christianity. That was the commercial. I got away with that, Mr. Butler. That's, uh, yes. um, 
the, the question is, yes, those of us that are trying to form a global conservative Christian body out of all manner of flotsam across the Lutherans and Anglicans and Roman Catholics and to some extent Orthodox even, but mainly in the West, are grappling with the fact that we must provide positive answers to contemporary problems rather than be lost in some sort of reformation movement within the church trying to condemn what the church has always done and modernize it. Um, there is a vast difference between traditional Christianity responding to contemporary problems and Christianity making itself contemporary. There's a vast difference and uh, we're trying to make that distinction pretty clearly. Um, we do, in fact, and I hope that what I've said has, has indicated to some extent the fact that Christianity can indeed provide a substantial part of what is missing in contemporary politics. Now, I make no apologies for being um, a bishop who teaches politics. I accept no responsibility for Australian politics, but I make no apologies for being a bishop that teaches politics because, in fact, the answer to that question, what are human beings for, can only be given by religion. And most of the religious answers actually agree with each other. You can put them in different ways. You know, that marvellous penny catechism, God made me to know, love and serve him here on earth and to be happy with him forever in heaven. Um, if you've got that, you've got a political agenda. And it'll have a fair bit to do with freedom of religion and church education and family life and so on. Making free the ability to serve God. Uh, on, on the other hand, if you've decided that... Um, humans are the end of it all and you've got an, the sort of power that communists had in the 1940s and 50s then you'll ban worship and all talk of God and it will give you likewise an agenda because you've decided what human beings are for and what they're not for. Um, I think our engagement with politics has been extremely muted because we have not been game to suggest alternative ways of running the country all we've done is act like Her Majesty's loyal opposition. That's not us, mate. We are, in fact, the cutting edge of politics, not the opposition to it. We inform it and provide its basis. Now, if that makes me a, a political clergyman, well, Butte, yes. Um, I'm uh, not ashamed to have a couple of hours of radio a week and do what I can even to annoy the ABC, even while they're paying me to say it. So um, I, I think we must be much more game in suggesting that there are certain ways of running society and this is it and argue for it and that will combine elements of the democratic because we believe in individual equality under the law that's absolutely fundamental that every human has a value which must be identical we believe in life we believe in family we believe in a mutually nurturing society and therefore against anything that rips off individuals and society. And I, I think we've been very muted in the church, um, the Anglican church, which is moving towards full equality, for instance, for homosexuals within the clergy and doing gay marriages in church, has obviously got an enormous difficulty opposing gambling by saying families are important. Because they've cut themselves off somewhere just below the waist. <coughs> <coughs> Yes, well, I always said they didn't have much in that area in the last few decades. Uh, more questions? Um, there's heaps of them here. You've been at it for a while, so yes. Bishop Hepworth, we've been talking today largely about the loss of our bedrock faith in Western Christian circles. Is it true to say that the world of, say, Islam has similarly lost its bedrock? And if not, where do they fit on this enormous world stage if they regard us as being weak and corrupt? Has Islam lost its bedrock the same as Christianity and where do they fit on this world stage? Um, we would have laughed at Islam 50 years ago as being not a serious religion uh, in full, in full um, hiding, almost as we would laugh at parts of Christianity today. Now, Islam has had a massive resurgence and they've done it by rediscovering their faith in fundamentals. 
They've rediscovered scholarship. They've rediscovered um, biblical practice, if I can put that in inverted commas, it's basically what they've rediscovered. Now, like any group that have just discovered something after some hundreds of years of not really do it, taking it seriously, um, they've gone overboard. Christianity has done this at various moments when it's rediscovered the faith. And so, um, like the incidents of dysentery in Glasgow, um, religion also has cycles that, that are very hard to smooth out. And um, Christianity is probably now in the West, at least, in a stage of advanced secularization in which it's accommodated itself to the world, but people are beginning to rediscover that there's something else. They will probably go overboard and in another generation we'll have something else. Um, but uh, to the extent that that's what Islam is doing, I admire it. And the fact is that Islam has been prepared to challenge governments. Now, unfortunately for the Middle East, Islam has challenged extremely weak and stupid governments in the main, but it nonetheless challenged them, and it has insisted on certain fundamental standards being applied by governments. Now, many of us might be uncomfortable with some of them, um, but comfortable with the broad idea. And so I think we're reaching the stage where it's possible to have an engagement between Islam and Christian scholars, and I've seen some evidence of that already, who are prepared to take seriously the problem of tackling modern governments, in which hopefully the dialogue, some of the perhaps more extremities on both sides, we do have some Christians trying to influence governments in parts of the world that leave a few rough edges exposed, um, and I think that's very natural too. But to the extent that, that I'd say Islam is probably 20 years ahead of Christianity in that evolution at this stage that they have successfully tackled most governments in Islamic countries. There are, what, one Islamic nation left with a secular government, avowedly? Egypt is almost the only one, seriously. Um, that's not a bad hit rate from 20 years ago when there weren't any. Now, um, uh, whether that is the way for Christianity to go or not, I, I seriously doubt. But certainly it does teach us the ability to engage with weak governments and conquer them. And at least it reveals that. And not all of them were all that weak. So, yeah, I, I think we are moving towards a period when fundamental religious values will have to be synthesised with democratic values and reach some form of new synthesis that will come out of that in which governments will have a different reason for existing uh, we heard earlier about the spread of Christianity I think that that's part of this too the fact is it's becoming more difficult Africa India Central America for governments to ignore the challenge of religion on the one hand even if it, we can all be rude about liberation theology on the other hand, it is a serious religious challenge to the doings of some quite corrupt governments. That much I can rejoice in, whilst being a touch worried about their agenda. Hmm? So am I making a distinction? Yes. Hmm. Yes. Bill. Um, Bob Santa Maria has access to the media, and uh, I understand him. I attempt to understand what he's getting at when he's talking about economic affairs. His suggestion was that governments were dependent on bondholders, specifically mentioned bondholders in from transnational corporations, international finance, etc. That's one point. Um, I'm inviting I, I, your comment, Mark. Um, some years ago, um, because I regarded the organisation, the so-called elitist organisation, like the Trilateral Commission, as maybe suspect, threatening to nationalism and so on. Um, I persuaded the International Affairs mob in Melbourne to get the Trilog magazine, and uh, they sent back the first issue of it, a book, uh, a booklet called um, Democracy Must Work which uh, subsequently I gave to Geoffrey Blaney to uh, look at. Uh, 
then uh, I never got the book back and I have an institute that they were not. That was the title of the book and I know that Dave Bowen was one of the co-authors of it. Um, and the other uh, comments on another book put out by the Trilateral Commission called um, um, There is Too Much Democracy. Uh, that was written by uh, the Spotlight, which is a revisionist type of, and critical of these sort of organizations from a newspaper in America. Uh, well, having thrown that up, and in relation to your comments, which I recall on the on speaking of democracy, etc., and so on, I just wonder if you have any comments about that. So the issue is around the Trilateral Commission and other agencies and democracy. Um, yeah, I think that, I'd, could I make one comment? Um, when you're designing a nation, such as Australia was and possibly thinks it is again, um, you, ha and you not only have to decide your basic philosophy, which we haven't done yet, but you also have to decide whether you're going to aim for efficiency or freedom. You, you in fact, either need a government that can efficiently move people around or stop them moving around and changing jobs and stop them living in uncomfortable and uneconomic places and so on. The model would be Japan or Singapore that I'm thinking of, or Korea, South Korea, um, where people are fairly tightly controlled in basic parameters of daily life. Um, and they're rich so they don't notice it is the beautiful theory. They're beginning to notice. You either go that way or you can maximise freedom, in which case government will by definition be inefficient. Now the fathers of the Australian Constitution opted for massive inefficiency because they wanted to be free. After all, people were descended from a range of stock that had had bad experiences with government. And I'd like to point out that, in fact, very few people are in Australia because of the efficiency of a government anywhere else. They're all here because of bad government. That is our common thread. Um, whether we are recent migrants or whether we were here in the first fleet, we have a common experience of government which is unfortunate. And that drove us here. Um, and so we designed a constitution which maximised the individual freedom whilst crippling government. And it's absolutely pointless in Australia to grizzle about the inefficiencies of government because that is deliberate and would require a very conscious shift to move it in the other direction. Now, having said that, we tend to make ourselves feel good by equating maximum freedom with democracy and equating efficient government with lack of democracy and so we snort at Singapore. Now, I suspect that that is a very facile view of democracy and that there is a balance to be found somewhere because democracy after all is not essentially about the individual versus the society. It is about the way in which people merge in society with mutually respected rights and obligations. And if we shift our model of democracy, I think we begin to make more sense of this. That um, this concept of the rugged individual standing against society is not really good. The concept of the rugged individual standing against the government is the British model, Magna Carta. And that's a much more satisfactory one. But then you inevitably end up with a concept of the people which is more than just a joke. In Australia, the concept of the people is a bit of a joke. Am I making sense? Well, let's go. One question. We, 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 oh, there is one other one here too. I, I, I won't forget you. Great. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed what you had to say. You've answered a lot of questions. I'm speaking for myself, but hopefully everybody else in the room. What do you see as the most effective thing I can do? Um, we are coming up for several hurdles for sovereignty. The Constitution is under massive threat, as you know. The first hurdle is making effective use of the Constitutional Convention that's coming up. And it's a hurdle thrown in our path. Um, we have the potential for winning it. But effective use of that election campaign that starts next week with the nominations and runs through November, effective support for those who are going to Canberra in February, 
and the aftermath of that. I think we have a series of clearly defined hurdles. Um, uh, certainly, what, that's something of utter practicality that we can do. I think the second thing is that we more effectively engage with our Christian bodies who've got off pretty lightly in the last 10 years in Australia with not that much challenge. And sure, they thrash out like a mob of commissars whenever you challenge them. Um, I've had a fair bit of experience of that. Um, in fact, I'm having a terrible personality crisis since, since last year when I was made bishop because in my book, Bishops and Mob of Thugs, and uh, I don't quite see myself that way yet, but um, almost every experience I've ever had with a bishop has been bad. So um, there, there's this terrible conflict going on, it's almost schizophrenia. But um, uh, the, um, the fact is churches have and are getting away with absolute blue murder in Australia and elsewhere, but let's confine to Australia. Uh, the Uniting Church, the Anglican Church and the Catholic Church, just for starters, have all acted like thugs in the last 20 years in one or another way. I don't need to spell it out. You know what I'm talking about. And pockets of, of conservative creativity have been ruthlessly destroyed. And that's a tragedy. And we know quite well that in order to find somewhere in the scripture the idea that, for instance, same-sex marriage should be conducted in church on exactly the same terms as um, heterosexual marriage, to find that in scripture requires a significant rewriting. <laughs> <coughs> and yet we keep being told it's all right. Well, I think it takes a real nerve to challenge that, but the beginnings of reform is challenge. And that's a second practical thing. Um, the temptation, and I've succumbed to it, is to drift off and go nowhere because you're so upset with a whole damn lot of them. Um, we all go through that stage, that's fair enough. But we should come out the other end and come out fighting. Here, here. Now, look, I know you're really enjoying this. Uh, we're over time. That's not a tragedy. Uh, we'll, we'll just see how we go, but I don't think there can be too many more. Yes. I meant eccentric in the best possible way. As somebody who reads Bertie Wodehouse for fun, eccentric has a different meaning. <laughs> I apologise if I've offended. But what I, what I was meaning is that some Christians have always, with a sense of marvellous fun, done something different and done it with great joy. And the world simply can't understand why they're doing it. Now, I have no problem with that in the least. Um, what I do have a problem with is Christians pretending there is no agenda but that of the popular world and shaping the church in that image. That is not eccentric, that is bloody minded. And, uh, but the other, no, I, I have nothing but admiration and gratitude for those who do quite extraordinary things, as St Paul says, uh, because we are all fools for Christ. And the more the merrier. Mm. And I, I, being Anglican, I can quote St Thomas More to you. On his way to his execution, he said to the man who was about to behead him, Ye pray for me and I'll pray for ye that we may both merrily meet in heaven. <laughs> Ted. Um, um, I'm going to keep them quick. Question short. Yeah. Solzhenitsyn um, remarked that uh, God created both nations and races. And uh, so he brought the question of sovereignty right to the fore. Mm -hmm. um, can we depart from the point that uh, both nations and individuals are sovereign and that uh, the government of those nations should ensure that sovereignty remains? The question is about the sovereignty of nations and individuals and uh, how can they both be accommodated. And of course you're absolutely right and I don't intend to get at this stage into the argument with Locke and Hume and all of those lads. 
about um, whether government is a, is a badge of lost innocence or whether it is a sign of our being redeemed. Um, one can come at it from both directions and I think you can accommodate both. Uh, government is both good and bad at the same time. And government of course exists not only to um, create sovereignty, government is the external sign of sovereignty. At the same time it is the protector of the individual within that sovereignty. So um, uh, I don't see a, a conflict there but I do know that governments normally get it wrong and the overwhelming temptation in the 20th century has been for governments to regard the individual as meaningless and that's certainly something that all religions contribute to the refutation of. Well, I did get the impression mm. from your earlier remarks that you felt that uh, sovereignty was something that was lost to us and couldn't be regained. Sovereignty of nations, I think, will never be the same again. Um, sovereignty of races is another matter. Nations cannot, because of the march of technology, restore themselves to what they were 20 years ago. That is simply not possible unless we go back from the technology both of war and communication. No nation can isolate itself in that sense and so we must define sovereignty differently. Now how we define it we don't know because we haven't started yet. We've simply accepted the diminished sovereignty. Now I don't believe we can restore it in the way that it was but we maybe can develop it in quite new ways and that's one of the things that I've suggested there's a vacuum that we have things to fill. Now, I really don't believe we can go backwards. I mean, nobody is about to give up their mobile phones. And mobile phones are a symbol of diminished sovereignty. The government doesn't own the switch. They can't stop you ringing on a satellite owned by somebody else, somebody in another country, and so the government has lost the ability to police its borders in that way. Can we stop Playboy coming into Australia anymore? No, because it's on the internet. We you know, confiscate them at the wharf has nothing to do with it anymore. The fact is the government cannot control in any nation on earth, the government cannot control what the people read anymore, full stop. Now that is a very significant diminishing of sovereignty that will never return until we run out of electricity. But this, this nation will continue to produce so many million litres of milk every day, so hmm. many tonnes of Oh yes, yes. Mm. Oh yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm not saying it's gone, I'm saying it's diminished. And I'm trying to identify the ways in which it's diminished. And the crucial way is that we no longer control access internationally in the ways we once could and did. We once, for instance, exercised quite a high level of censorship we, on, on imports. We no longer do, because we can't, because the printed word is technologically irrelevant to that process. You beam it in through your, commu your, your computer and you print it out and the government is simply not in the chain anymore of command. Now that, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's gone totally. It's diminished and may well go on being diminished as governments give up the right for instance to control imports and exports of food which is part of the GATT agenda. Now if that goes ahead the sorts of things you're talking about will have been diminished as well. Nobody will be checking the ships at the wharf because the world has decided to give it up. In Europe it already has. There are no internal customs. Now that means France is not as sovereign over wheat and wool as it was five years ago. Oh yes, I'm not saying who's doing it, I'm just saying it's happened. Well I was saying who's doing it too but um, yeah, I mean, who did it is a different question to whether it's done. And all I'm suggesting is that many of these things have been done and you can chart them. That in fact there is less sovereignty sloshing around in the global system because of things like what the European community has done to border controls. They don't. Now a country that has given up the policing of its borders has given up significant sovereignty except for Australians who still need to pay money at France in order to get in. How they tell us apart from real people I've not quite worked out. They always manage to catch me. <laughs> Just as a comment on that, put my own two bobs worth in, I think the reacquisition of effective sovereignty um, will only emerge 
honestly from some lateral thinking. And the difficulty with that is that will only come from individuals and they are very isolated and they really don't have a, a, a market, if you like, at the moment. And Australians pride themselves with being great inventors. In fact, they submit more patents than the rest of the world put together. It's just about at that level, many times more than the United States. Um, but we're noted for not taking up those ideas. We have them. And I think it's the same in, the, in these sorts of areas because often the answer in the modern world is a rather technical answer. And the fellow that's got the lateral thinking, he, how do you qualify somebody? Uh, there's no degree in reclaiming our sovereignty. There's no ticket for that. And I think the most lacking thing is some way of letting the eccentricity of lateral thinking peep in through the window somehow uh, so that it can be recognised and developed. I think it's possible. What's got to come first, though, is the will to reclaim our sovereignty in keeping with the world in which we now live to progressively reclaim it in those ways that it can and should be reclaimed and it's a big question but I'm, I'm not I'm not asking you that question because I don't think any of us know the answer at the moment not even start. no but that that's that's one that exercises my mind and I, I don't I'm looking for a lateral inspiration I've got an ant colony at my place that's very sovereign and won't give up its sovereignty no matter what I do to it, it retains it. <coughs> yes, and that, yes, exactly, exactly. The, the highest, I mean, when you get down to, there are some biological realities. I mean, the nature of what, of nature of we as a creation predetermines a certain outcome. If we're long and patient and have the faith, and go forward. All right, now, I better get a question because it's not my night, and we, and not many, eh? It, is there one or two very quick and concise and questions? Yes, yeah, been trying very patiently, okay. All right. Uh, you know the fact that this dwindling spiral of uh, decadence is going on, it's going to go on for some time around the world. I predict we'll have more and more civil unrest like what we had in Los Angeles some years ago and also what you hear in England where cars are overturned and set on fire and so on by this civil unrest. Really because there's so much discontent and uh, breakdown of law and order. Does that mean we're going to have a lot more casualties of innocent, uh, among innocent people? I'm sure mankind becomes more responsible. Yes, there's a question about more and more civil unrest. And I, I could have gone on and on, some would say I have gone on and on, but um, one of the things I could have mentioned in, in the role of government changing in relationship to people is the fact that as they've given up all the caring roles, they've taken on more and more of the policing roles, so we have more police than we've ever had, and with more powers. And uh, as people become more and more anarchical, or as society does, so do governments become more and more the agents of the private sector in controlling us. Um, it's the Industrial Revolution all over again. Now, whether they're very effective, I don't think they particularly are, but they're a nuisance. And um, technology joins in, of course, as well. We can no longer drive as once we did without getting caught. But um, the, uh, you know, that, that's a popular symbol of it. And our normal interaction with government is driving laws. So. Um, the relationship changes yet again and democracy is yet again diminished and freedom is yet again diminished. But um, we obviously will have significant problems there. Yes, we are having. Thanks. Um, I'm going to leave you wanting more um, because we have done very well and I'm going to ask um, Jeremy Lee to come forward and move a vote of thanks to our, all of our three speakers today. While he's doing it, I'll just remind you that 
it's not over if you want to tap into what Bishop Hepworth is about um, you can put your name down and get a couple of issues of his <coughs> newspaper for those of us who are sort of Anglicans and traditional ones it's got a, a special meaning but um, I believe that the Bishop has quite a bit of editorial input so I think there's every prospect that we may have a journal one day that actually addresses the sort of questions that we all desperately want to have addressed for the first time even if perhaps not all that well at times it would be something so without further ado Jeremy Well, uh, Your Grace and Jim Thompson and Eric Butler, ladies and gentlemen, ever since I first uh, came to my first league seminar, which was 1965, I've been conscious of the fact that every year there is a theme. Um, it, it was always my regret that the one that interested me most of all, which was one run on the question of leisure and work and social credit, had taken place before I ever heard of the League of Right. And I've read that literature time and time again and, and have only wished that I could have been there at that seminar. It must have been very special. I think we need that again, perhaps, sometime. Um, the other highlights, of course, are various papers that have been given through the years since then. You think of people like Sir Raphael Salento, who always held his audience absolutely rapt. <laughs> And then that marvellous paper given by Doug Christie that, if any of you heard that, was an absolute milestone. But the theme this year is very, very important. Um, I think as much for the timing that there is a, uh, a huge awakening and a huge, if you like, um, yearning for some absolute that we can begin to reach and cling to in this disintegrating period that these papers have all been very important and therefore it's a privilege for me to be able to give this vote of thanks and to say also it's, it's a slight penance because in every case I've got uh, confessions to make. The first confession I'd like to make is that when I first heard Eric speak on some of the things that he spoke on in his paper today I, I really thought that uh, he was a bit of a heretic and if only we could straighten him out from a Christian point of view, how marvellous it would be, rather like getting him into an old school tie. And as we've gone through, and I've heard and thought about the things that he has said, what I've really realised is, is that he was so far ahead of us, that what was happening was that we were catching up with him, if anything. There was no straightening Eric out.